Good afternoon. Bon tardi. A warm welcome to the Prime Minister of Aruba, Her Excellency Ms. Evelina Wafer Cruz, the Rector of the University, Viola Heutre, and we have a Member of Parliament, Ms. Gunn. Ladies and some gents, distinguished guests, esteemed speakers, my name is Deborah van den Berg Alexander and I'm the coordinator for the Center for Lifelong Learning here at the University of Aruba. Welcome to this webinar and seminar, sorry, because I'm used to doing some webinars, titled The Advancement of Women in Aruba, Quality of Education and Gender Equality. As you would recognize, both the aspect of quality and gender equality are based on the Sustainable Development Goals number four and five. Today's event prepares us to celebrate International Women's Day, which will be held worldwide next week, Tuesday, March 8th. International Women's Day is celebrated annually to commemorate the cultural, political, and socioeconomic advancement of women. It is also a focal point in the women's rights, women's rights movement, bringing attention to issues such as gender equality, reproductive rights, and violence and abuse against women. But today, we will bring the focus a bit closer to home, giving insights on the different roles and responsibility women play here in our society. We will also highlight the history of women's participation within the urban society. And I think it's important that when we are looking at what happens here in Aruba, that we involve testimonials. And that's why we've ha we have two of our students, alumni of the university, sharing their experience in relation to gender and equality and how that they have been able to succeed here in Aruba. Mm -hmm. Last but not least, we will be looking at the Aruba Gender Policy. It will be presented by the chair of the Gender Steering Committee Aruba for the first time. After this, we will become, we'll get a bit active. We expect your active participation in changing the role of the woman here in Aruba. For that part, the facilitator and my colleague, Sharice Mundeli, will take over but I promise it will be interesting. But before we go to our speakers, I would like to highlight that this seminar is in collaboration with the government of Aruba and Instituto Pedagogico Aruba, IPAP. This and upcoming events are and will be part of the national gender project that is coordinated by Dr. Paula Kebelar from the IPAP. It is definitely supported by the rector and her prime minister. All upcoming events after this will hopefully result in a publication on gender, education, and motherhood in Aruba. So let's get started. I would like to welcome Dr. Viola Heutre, director of the university, to the podium. Welcome to the University of Aruba. I'm very, very glad to see all of you here. Who of you has ever heard of Constance Baker Motley? Some 60 years ago, she was the first Afro-American woman to be a federal judge in the US. She should or she could have been appointed to the US Supreme Court. Her talent and training were enormous. She was eminently qualified. As women, we hope the talent and training and hard work bring us to those positions where we can make a difference. But she, Constance Baker Motley, did not make it up to the US Supreme Court. However, she became one of those exemplary people we need. Vice President Kamala Harris explicitly cites Motley's influence 
on her own political and law career. We are now 60 years later. I hope that soon everybody will know about Katani Brown Jackson. Last week, President Biden nominated Katani Brown Jackson to be the first black woman to sit on Supreme Court. And KBG cited Motley as an influence on her own career in the speech accepting Biden's nomination. These are global examples which show that equality is still not the standard and sometimes it needs 60 years for making one new Supreme Court judge being an Afro-American woman. Looking into the biographies of millions of women, we have to state that more factors are decisive for success than only training and hard work and talent. And therefore, it's so important that we meet, that we are reunited here today at the University of Aruba to empower each other, to engage, and to share our best practices and success stories. Katani Brown Jackson can be the role model, not only for our law students, but for all of us. At our university, women are represented on most levels as a majority. There are more female students than male students, more women with a PhD than men. From April onwards, all our deans of our four faculties are female, and the rector is a woman too. Furthermore, we have graduates being a mother and graduating cum laude. We have another mother graduating some weeks ago with five kids. We have female graduates at top positions. A lot to be proud of. However, at the top of our academic positions, our professors, there is so far only one female professor Professor Robin Di Pietro, next to six male professors. That is 14%. The Minister of Education appointed myself a month ago. Now two out of eight professors are female, still only 25%. Our highest board, the Board of Trustees of the University of Aruba, consists out of four male and one female member, Tisa Lasorte. 20% female. So even at our university, we still have to strive for gender equality. Looking to the government, we see a similar a picture, a female prime minister, warmly welcome, but most ministers are male. But I think we can be very proud on the islands to have often and not only once a female prime minister. So that's good news that many of the positions on the islands are in female hands. So the idea to celebrate a Women's Day spread over the whole world since the year 1909. More than 100 years later, we still have a way to go. But we can share already many biographies from those who paved the way for us. I'm really looking forward to listening to our speakers of tonight and meeting all of you. This evening with this full aller is, yeah, the result of a meeting of a handful of enthusiast women. I think we were even four, only four, in the peak at the top of the corona infection on the island, hitting nearly the number of 5,000. We were thinking, is it feasible to organize something? And our poor enthusiasm said, yes, for sure. My special thanks go to Dr. Paula Kibela. She is really the motor behind it. And to our prime minister, Evelyn Weber Cruz, and to Sandra Cruz, who immediately said, yes, we believe that the university could make happen such an event, even in difficult times with all this, yeah, you don't know what happens the next day at that moment when we had the planning, seeing all these COVID figures. 
Thanks to my own team, Deborah Alexander and Charisse Hoon, and all participants of our kickoff meeting that provided us with so much inspiration. And a special thing, thanks to Joycelyn Cruz, who immediately came with so much data that we could have filled weeks, I think even weeks, and not only a day. We started with an idea, without an agenda, without a budget, only some weeks ago. The idea spread. We received a lot of support. We could have filled many agendas, many meetings, and as you heard, we go on with the subject. And we had many potential speakers, and we all would like to give these wonderful ladies the floor in the future. We had to make choices for the event of today. And today, I may welcome all of you here to the University of Aruba. Welcome, and thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Viola, for that welcome. As we have a very tight schedule, we will be moving on. Now it is a pleasure to welcome our keynote speaker for the evening, the Prime Minister of Aruba, Her Excellency, Mrs. Evelina Wefer Cruz. Good evening, ladies, especially gentlemen in the room. Of course, it's a great honor and a pleasure for me to be here today discussing women and women and education. I want to first of all thank the University of Aruba director, Dr. Paula Kibelar, um, Sandra for assisting me. Um, because when these ladies came up with the idea, there was simply no way to say no to organizing such a great event. And seeing all of you this evening here, it just confirms that it was a great initiative. Thank you so much. Today, I want to elaborate on the various roles, the different roles and responsibilities of women in our society. I will start by saying that I never felt that I had different opportunities than men throughout my life or my, my career. But becoming prime minister changed this and has made me realize that I have been privileged to have this experience. Around the world and in Aruba as well, we have been able to observe much progress and in, in advancement of women. And the mere fact that I am delivering this message today in 2022 as the first female prime minister of Aruba proves that we are making progress. But it also shows that we still have gains to make. Being a female prime minister does not necessarily mean that you automatically make a difference in the advancement of women in Aruba or to the promotion of gender equality in your country. It takes a dedicated effort and it takes a joint effort. And I have decided that I want to make a difference together with all of you, all the strong women here in this room and in the country of Aruba. The reason for this is that we all strive for a more prosperous, a more sustainable world that cannot be reached without greater gender equality. Greater gender equality should also be seen as smart economics, as enhancing productivity and improving other outcomes that help us progress as a nation, including prospects for the next generation and for the quality of policies and institutions. In fact, I strongly believe that no society can develop sustainably without transforming the distribution of opportunities, of resources and choices for men and women so they have an equal power to shape their own lives and share the responsibilities in contributing to their families, their communities, or their country. So do we agree that if we want a more sustainable community, that we need to have more female participation in the decision-making process? Do we agree? I think that we all agree. However, 
we are a long way to achieving this. So what can be the main reason some women do make it and others do not? If we look around us, we can establish that we still miss female representation in important places. The director already um, said it, but let me first ask you to think about the following question. Do you think we need more female representation in government and parliament in making decisions? Do you really think that we need more women? Let's look around us. Of 21 members of parliament, eight are female. We have here Ms. Aquanet Gon, one of the female uh, members of parliament. Eight of 21, 38%, not even 50. Ministers in cabinet, two of eight, 25% not even 50. In the last elections, four of the 12 political leaders were female, 33%, all less than half. Do you think this is a problem? I think this is a problem because I firmly believe that women should be part of the decision-making pro process. Otherwise, we can safely say that women are excluded from the decision-making. And because, and I want to say this with all respect and affection to our gentlemen, a, a woman will be more committed than a man in handling female issues, if you can say it, policy issues. So if you agree with me that we do have a problem because we are underrepresented, what do you think is the problem? What is the cause of this problem that prevents female participation in politics? Do we think it's because of men, that men try to keep us down? Do you think that we should fight for women to have more power than men? I don't. I fight for women to have more power over themselves because there is where we should start. I do not think that men are the problem. Of course, like in everything, there are some exceptions of men not wanting women to succeed, but I believe that in many cases, the problem lies within ourselves as women. Think about this. Do, do you agree with me that the underrepresentation of women in parliament and government is a problem? You agree. Then, how would you feel about joining politics? I see some politicians here in the room, but others that are not politicians. How would you feel in joining politics? I can hear you thinking. Some of you are thinking, indeed, that's a good idea because we can implement more changes. After all, we as women, we bring more to the table. We are uh, more empathic, we have more empathy, we are more creative, um, uh, we are more understanding. Some say it's a fact that uh, female leaders can handle public finances better than male leaders. But I'm also sure that the most of you are thinking, me, politics, never. Why? My family, my private life, my free time, my children, my career. I don't want to be insulted, offended, right? And you know, I understand you because I used to be you. I had the same concerns until I ran out of excuses to not be in public office. Because I thought that if someone has to do it, why not me? I just, at that moment, could not look at the situation and complain without taking action. So here I am. And that is why getting more women to run for political office is a priority for me. So please think about the questions that I've asked. I'm the first female prime minister, but I'm not the last. And we need, we need to stimulate other women to run for office because I do not want to be the last. You don't want me to be the last women in office. No. What, and on another note, what role do you think that a mother, her mother, her grandmother played in your life? I think that mothers, grandmothers play a significant role in how we turn out. I wanna share an anecdote. My grandmother, Anna, was born in 1900. She married, they had six children, three boys, three girls. Back then, 
The girls had to stay at home. They had to wash clothes, they had to iron clothes. If they were lucky, they could help the parents in their small businesses that they had. My grandmother didn't want that. She insisted when she was younger and she was allowed by her mother to study and to become a teacher. She was born in 1900. And she was a teacher till she became 70, 72 years old. So for my mother and her sisters, it was unthinkable that they could not go to school. They were even allowed to study abroad in the 50s and the 1950s and 1960s. And of course, my mother wanted me to succeed. So for my sister and me, it was not a problem to receive the same opportunities and treatment as my brother did receive. But unfortunately, this, this is not always the case. And there are too many examples of grandmothers, mothers, daughters, not working, not able to work, not able to study, receiving support from the government, not having much opportunities in life. And many of, of them become victim of abusive relations and they do not see a way out. So what if we could turn things around? Break the cycle, make sure that girls get equal opportunities as boys or even more opportunities than boys. Three years ago, I started an initiative, STEM the Gap. STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and math. And through STEM, through these, um, these areas, I wanted to try to close the gap between boys and girls. We organized projects that stimulated girls to explore STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, because we wanted to prepare them for the future. And why? Because we know now that when they become adults, the jobs that they will have do not even exist now. So how can we prepare them now for something that doesn't exist? We can merely give them the tools. We also know that in the future jobs will be more inclined towards STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. And we also know that boys like STEM better than girls. So if we do not push and stimulate the girls now into that direction, the advantages that we and the generation prior to us have achieved on gender balance will be lost. And I refuse to accept that. Besides, there's another very important fact coming out of the pandemic. We know that during the pandemic, the ones that were hardest affected by the pandemic were the most vulnerable groups, women, children, and the elderly. If now coming out of the pandemic with the rebuilding and, and uh, the, the plans that we have to, to build a better and stronger Aruba, if, we, if now we do not concentrate on this fact, if we do not put more attention now to the position of women and help these women also through this phase of recuperation and rebuilding, everything that our mothers, our grandmothers, their grandmothers have done before us will also be gone. So that's why today is a very important day. Aruba is in rec recuperation after COVID. Our tourism recuperation was 72% and 2021. We're not there yet, but we are on the right track. We are bouncing back, but we do not want to only bounce back. We want to bounce forward. We want a better, a stronger, a more resilient Aruba, better than before COVID. And we cannot do this without more female representation everywhere public sector, private sector, academia, NGOs, everywhere. Women bring what it takes to the table. We are creative, we are innovative, we can be very strict sometimes if necessary, but we also have empathy when necessary. Now, what we need is for women to stand with each other and to help each other. So it is with great joy that today I can announce that we have our first gender policy for Aruma. Our first comprehensive national strategy and framework 
that was developed together with the UN Women, the United Nations Women. It is a path towards the advancement of women in Aruba. And this strategy, as outlined in the national gender policy, is understood as critical and central to the further and inclusive and human-centered development of Aruba and the achievement of Aruba's sustainable development goals. The national gender policy that we will be presenting today can only have a successful implementation if we do this together. And I count on each and every one of you to make this successful. Thank you. Thank you very much to the Prime Minister for that interesting speech. As she said, the problem lies within ourselves, but the solution definitely also. And as last week we had a book presentation by Christy Hammer on quit being so good women, you know, how to be unapologetic. Her advice to us was to take up space. Let's start being first and let's seek in helpers because here there are many helpers amongst us. So very interesting book and let it be an inspiration uh, for us. Our next speaker is Sharon Meyer. I had the pleasure of, Sharice and I had the pleasure of interviewing her yesterday for our radio program, Straight Up Conversation About Education, where we learned quite a lot, but she's also no stranger to the University of Aruba, having completed three ma well, masters, being one, so yeah, two, yeah, and also having uh, graduated cum laude. Sharon Meyer van der Linde, is a policy advisor foreign at foreign economic relations at the Department of Economic Affairs of Aruba. And she develops policy and advices on stimulating international trade in areas such as ma market access, market exploration, access to capital, market intelligence, and business development. Sharon is engaged in the economic integration process stimulating and supporting the private sector in the field of export opportunities, promoting a solid national economy aimed at promoting small and medium-sized enterprises for Aruba. Moreover, she is the driving force behind the success of the Export Dex unit, which is an initiative to promote export amongst local entrepreneurs. But as I learned yesterday, mainly women as well. Sharon, please come to the stage. Hey, um, thank you, Deborah, for that introduction. Yes, I'm a really proud alumni of the University of Aruba. Um, I have to say also that this presentation, as you can see, um, I dedicated to my mother. Um, as our prime minister said, um, our mother sometimes is our driving force. I did first the faculty of law. Um, there I got my first two boys. Then with my small children, I did the faculty of economic and finance. And yes, I graduated cum laude. And now I'm busy with my MBA. And um, in a few days, my baby will, <laughs> will be two, three boys. <laughs> so why do I dedicate this to my mother? Because she instilled in me, it's about mentality. We can achieve anything we put our mind to as long as we do it with integrity, no matter what we do. Therefore, I was asked today to do a historical overview of the Aruban women. So I'm asking all of you to embark with me on this journey in 
10 minutes, we're going to fly and go over the highlights of um, this historical um, overview, which will include social, educational, legal, and economic aspect. So why a historical overview? Because we have to learn from yesterday so we can live for today and we can hope and dream for tomorrow. So it's important, um, the important thing is not to stop questioning. That's why we are here today. That's why we will start this conversation. And that's why we are really proud um, later on to discuss the Aruba gender policy. So to give um, a historical overview, we have before 1640, we're going way back in time. There, um, our Aruban women were Arawaks, Tainos, Caribbean. And in 1640, we were introduced to um, slaves from Africa. We have a big gap back then, then in 1900s, our women were hat weavers, housewives, and the unmarried women were nannies. So they had to take care for children in, in their families. But most women had no income. Then we see a change from 1907 to 1927, where we see that women were baker, um, they gather salt, they, they were teacher, merchant, farmer, nurse. Um, you can see um, 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 they did laundry and they sold fish and 73.5% of our women were active in the labor market. This due to migration. A lot of men back then had to migrate to um, Venezuela, Colombia, Cuba, or Suriname. However, we see another change um, in this aspect. In 1947, with the arrival of Lago, only 7.2% from 73.5% to 7.2% of women were active in the labor market. But again, in this journey, we see it was paved by a lot of extraordinary women. And we had also women movements. I'm going to mention, I know there were more, but because of time, I'm going to highlight the, the most um, influencers won. So in 1984, we have Grupo Pegasaya, 1985, Grupo Kawara, 1988, Grupo Mujer 88, 1982, Grupo Uni y Bantopa. We had also Grupo Alue, Muso, Mujer Nang Uni Solidario, Mamona, Platform for Rights, Position of Women. However, as we can see, the legal part were, were not up to par back then. So again, this is only few highlights for us to realize that it wasn't like way back. It's only a few years. Like in 1884, CEPA, Grupo de Servicio de Gene Mujer, um, together with Osticeba and FTA, they started advocating for breadwinners allowance of 25%, child allowance, health insurance, um, warranty scheme, that is Haranci Regeling. In 1884, in 1984 was the first equal pay lawsuit and it was lost. This was, um, CMAR started with, with this um, lawsuit, but then they tried again in 1989 together with CEPA with Mamona Foundation and that lawsuit was won. And I have to mention this amazing because again, we have in this, um, month that we are celebrating women, celebrating the women again, that I, that I say that paved the way before us. So um, the lawsuit consisted of Helen Gouda. She was a single mother. So back then single mother earned 25% less than men in equal work. Um, Frida Cruz, she was a married woman. However, what was interesting was the, um, the case was also with Ralph Breite, an unmarried man. As we are now, um, Talking about gender relation, yes, back then, even if you were an unmarried man, you earned 20% less than a married man. And another example of this is our LMA. I'm a public servant now, so I don't know, <laughs> there are a lot of public servants here. So before 1992, um, Article 95 and 96 of the LMA stated that at marriage, the, the woman was fired. You cannot get married and stay with your job. 
The same if, if you decided to go live together. This expired um, only after 1992. Again, it's not long ago. March 8, 1996, we have, um, it started already in 1995 where a commission was is installed and um, for the Women Affairs Office, Bureau of Frau and Zaka. Now we have since 2010, sit them. But those commission members back then were Karen Refos, Nicole Hoovers, Angelique Peterson, Noris Donata, Alice de Cuba, and Helen van der Waal. And of course, today we have to, to highlight that Aruban women, a journey paved by extraordinary women, we're starting with our prime minister, um, our first and now we're going to go again. I have to mention these names because they were the first Aruban female extraordinaries. Our first minister, Nelens Antilles, Faustina Frank. Island, our first island counselor, also Nelen, back then, Nelens Antilles, Laura Pascal. Minister after status aparte, Eya Sagaray. Parliamentarians, Grace Barreño and Digna Laclay. Um, our first Grifir. Um, Jaceline um, Bastians, President of Parliament, Mervin Ross, Teacher, um, Jeffrey Zeppenveld, um, Rector, Lydia Emerenza, here at the University of Aruba. Um, our first doctor, PhD, um, PhD, Eva Latham. Our first attorney, Carol Francis. Our first doctor, Debbie Beslip. Our first firefighter, Nadia Lopez. Our first ministry, Penny again, Eya Yasagaray. That's why we have to put her, her picture. <laughs> uh, first minister and first minister, Penny Pontussieri. Party leader, MPA, uh, Monica Koch. Central Bank, Jane Semelier. SEPA, Magali Brito. CIMAR, Madonna Stevens. Atia, Joyce Bartersdal. Um, police woman, Dina Ler, Miriel Barleman, and Jeanette Soluchnier. Police inspector, Angeline Fleming. Commissioner, through the hassle. And I know there are in other managerial positions, like at our department, women directors, winner, women business owners, and um, women leaders in the um, economic industry. However, as our prime minister um, also mentions, we are not, not there yet. So now we're going to do some stats, some uh, statistic about women. So portion of women in managerial positions, we see it varies. However, from 2000 um, to 2019, we see an improvement. It, it stayed um, the same. However, we're still under 50%. Um, also, as was mentioned, the proportion of seat held by women in the parliament and local governments, we see indeed from 2001 to 2009, there were four, we doubled, but as we see the percentages in um, orange, we see again, we can improve in, in, in governments. Um, if we see the activity status of person 14 years and older employment, we can pleasantly, and I was surprised to see this, I checked it twice, that in 2020, um, women succeeded men. So again, we are on the right track. And um, economically active, also women succeeded men. Employed population by occupation group. Here we see that still women um, hold more um, service and sales positions. We see also, also elementary occupations and clerical support workers. We see again, as was mentioned, in technical um, services or um, other jobs, it's still, um, we're not there yet. The highest level of education, um, also we can see primary education, um, women um, exceed a little more, um, secondary education, um, there we can see that we have a majority of um, male um, students succeeding. Again, this is only between 15 and 24 because we can go to different um, um, age groups. And um, tertiary education, um, we, we, as I was mentioned by our rector, um, we have more women than female. 
because again, education is really important. So the Aruban Women journey unraveled. So this journey, as I mentioned, was paved by extraordinary women where there wasn't a clear path. It was in various instances made slowly but surely. And now I was thinking maybe to put a slide with different picture of women that succeeded. However, I was afraid to forget one. <laughs> so I was thinking who I'm going to, to choose, not as embodying all Aruban women, but someone that could start the conversation today. Sometimes she's polemical or controversial. Um, she's a social media motivator. She's 65 years old and she doesn't care to show her body to anyone. So because of that, I chose to show. <laughs> Mr. Mervine Cock. She's one of our Aruban women, as I mentioned, she's 65 years old. She told me she started her PhD. And um, again, I was looking for women for this presentation. And I said, I will put her because our Aruban women are strong, smart, confident, brave. And yes, we are fierce. We, we should never apologize for being a powerful woman. And as I said that, the history, the journey of the Aruban women unraveled, I wanted to say that we are not defined by our body. That's why I chose Mervine because she's proud of her body. Um, we are not defined by our body, our appearance, our age, or even our gender but by our willingness to go beyond obstacles before us to pave the future for our new generation. So I really want to thank, I see some of these amazing women here today, that some of them that paced this journey, I really want to thank um, all these women and hope that we all together can be the example for our future generation. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon, for that very, very interesting presentation. This is exactly the reason why we invited you today, because we really wanted to look at where did we come from? Many times we can have all the other types of conversations, but having the simple ones are the ones that matter. We would like to proceed now with looking really at unraveling the urban woman. And we would do that right here in the backyard of University of Aruba. Unfortunately, one of our speakers could not attend, but for a good reason. She recently graduated and she got a job. And of course, the job goes first. So we understand that, but we're happy that she was willing to take Well, I'm Ita Rose M. My mama is cinco you. My a kaba kolega vive on the year 2003. My kid on the year Ruba. 2004, my wife studied in Holland pharmacy, na University of Utrecht. My a kaba a bachelor. Or my to the base ko my a master. My a stop. My a bi a Ruba so my high level me you. I was ready to buy bed. This my kaba master. In a 2007, my a komisa recht na University of Ruba. Well, I think that I have two situations in my life. I have a lot of time to do this. And different things happen. And now I have to decide if I can understand that I have a lot of things in my life. And I have to say that I have a lot of things in my life. And I have to help me to my family. And now I have to decide if I can understand that I have a lot of things in my life. E a tata na rua também, que é algo que me pôr aqui daqui na rua, me uma raça. 
pero estudia y yunan cuánto yo voy a decir? Me di cinco yo. ¿Qué tú vas a hacer para vos para acabar con el estudio? No, sí, es difícil estar seguro, sí, pero me te quiero, me te tengo el soporte de mi pareja, de mi familia y ya me te da hobby determinado también, entonces si tú eres en el factor de un rol, me por acá para mi estudio. Y claro, me te tengo el ser de sabón que me te hace con, me te deal con mi tiempo y uh, me hace que faz hobby, me yunan también, así no nos puedo lograr, para mí puedo lograr mi, mi diploma ahora aquí. ¿Tú no nos dices un pista chiquito de un día de mi vida de Rosel? Bueno, well, mi hija me ayuda en todo el tiempo de la escuela, y yo voy a crecer, y ahora me ayuda a mi hija para hacer mi les, para mi niño dor, lo que me dice niño dor, um, dos horas más tarde nos les antes de comenzar, me ayuda a les, me ayuda a hacer todo el tiempo de les, me ayuda a hacer casi todo el les, me ayuda a hacer uno o dos días, y para mí que es una cosa crucial para ayudar a mi hija, que ya es una cosa mitad de diseñamiento que acaba, me ayuda también a tarde, um, más tarde la escuela va a dos para cuatro, y ahora me voy a casa, me ayudo a mi hija con las, me ayudo a mi hija con las, ahora me voy a dormir y me ayudo a mi hija con las. ¿Pero quién te cocina aquí en la papaya? ¿Quién te ayuda mucho en el baby? Bueno, nos tenemos, me tengo un buen team, me te quiere a mí que está de mi hija. Nos tenemos trabajo en partir, siempre de la cocina, y um, esta, esta hace algo y a mí te hace algo otro. Pero esta cocina a mí te lava con el equipo. Y así nos juntamos, nos te hace todo lo que me está por favor. Así. Y ahora, como te intentamos en un periodo, esta hace hobby más cómodo, pero así nos hace posible. Pero ¿cómo es el financiamiento? Pues, si vos casas, o mi respeto para vos casar con tu ayuda, ¿cómo también te sé? Bueno, financieramente nos está teniendo hobby muy bien. Seguro, ahora de COVID, pues sobre esta otra traja, y la perra de trabajo de eh, COVID, de toda medida, ¿no? nos quedan en la casa y en el momento y nos ayuda de diferentes instancias, Rode Cruz, Universidad de Aruba, me ayuda nos también de diciembre y familia, ¿no? Entonces aquí hay otro gente ayuda un tigre, así no se logra. ¿Cuál parte está interesado más y para qué? Bueno, lo que está interesado más más es Strafrecht, particularmente International Criminal Law. Siempre me ahora atraí para um, todo lo que tiene que ver con Strafra. Me te quiere que no se rompe problema social en Aruba y me te quiere si a mí voy a trabajar en cualquier área que tiene que ver con Strafra, con Strafra o algo así, ¿no? me puede ayudar para sobre um, mi dor de rompe experiencia de vida, pero sin rompe y me te quiere me puede trabajar para ayudar a rompe a gente. ¿Qué te vos sonido? Mi sonido es para ir a juez un día o para trabajar en la International Criminal Court que está en Den Haag. ¿Quién colocó que era para ver por la universidad así para durar sostener la mamá no me nego persona anteriores dos para estar por comer a cuesta que lo tomó por mi casa a mí te quiero lo que la universidad ya rubo por hacer para ayudar a mamá no a cualquier gente que está pasando difícil quizás un tata sus ojos y yo a un mamá con un más yo no me ha dado edad da quizás sino por bien con un, un fond con un por ayuda en gente aquí por sobre de mi casa a mí no por hacer estudio financiero más y no por ahí un tipo de línea que me, ahora a mí me será a comer, te pagas con el book y se te da hobby caro. Entonces, si no tiene un, un tipo de fondos que no te ayuda a gente a que paga el school help, es a que lo ayuda a hobby a gente. Me te quiere hobby, um, hobby mamá no lo por la escuela de manera aquí. Entonces, si vos vieras a juez maya, que lo te prometo, lo vos vieras a vos a seita algo con lo mío, es por el chenchín de bache. Me te quiere como juez, yo soy un hombre que me hace mi trabajo hobby bom, para mi trabajo hobby correcto, para mi walk, para mi seguir el ley, de manera que me acerta, pero también corre, que siempre que está corriendo, que está dil, y al final del día, el ley, todo lo que tiene que ser para ayudar al ser humano, para no me hacer olvidar que es la gente central, en que lo que tiene que es el texto de ley. Entonces, siempre me lo pongo de poner a la persona central haciendo mi trabajo bom. Y ya, me quiero como persona, si me da juez o no, me tengo que poner a ayudar a tu gente, no me da qué posición me da. Más que un tiki menos, pues hoy gente ayudarme y me quiero, ahora que me está haciendo leo, me seguro lo pay it forward de una manera u otra. Antonio, al final, ¿qué lo da un mensaje para que mamá no mueve, no mamá no cuyo, mamá no está pensando para hacer un cambio de la vida? A mí lo visa para hacer, ¿eh? Yo tengo que tiempo de ir, si yo estoy con él, está apto a ir. Yo me decidí que yo estoy con tiempo y cuatro años yo paso a ir a ir. Desde un cerrado de huevo, él pasa. Y um, ahora que me logra, yo tengo que ir a ir para lo que yo quiero hacer y quería que yo estoy aquí. Acá. I would like also to mention 
that that video was done, a collaboration with Charisse Hoon <laughs> daily. People would not think, but this was an experiment of Charisse, of course, with help with Mr. Jason in the back, but we're really grateful for this production because this is a very powerful message for all of us sitting there, but for other students at the university, male or female, doesn't matter. I'm sure we all have a story. So we have another student, alumni of the University of Aruba from the Faculty of Arts and Science, uh, the program Social um, Work and Development, Michelle Alonte, who would share her experience as a single mom um, here at the University of Aruba. Come forward. All right, thank you, Bombini. Well, I'm gonna start. Um, before I start, I really like to thank you, um, the University of Aruba, for actually allowing me to stand right here to use my voice and my life experience to actually motivate others that also have the same dream and same goal. Who am I? Well, she already told, my name is Michelle Elant. Many knows me in different roles. And I want to go actually a little bit more. Why these roles? Right, I'm an alumni at the University of Aruba. I finished um, social work and development, and therefore I'm a social worker by choice, right? I get to be called mommy by a six-year-old, right? I'm a sister, I'm a daughter, I'm a crazy friend, and I'm also a partner to somebody very special to me, right? For you to understand why I'm actually standing here, we have to go back seven years ago when actually I registered for the third time to become a student here at the University of Aruba. Yes, you heard right, three times I tried to become a student. And for the third time actually when I registered, I was pregnant and I didn't even know that. And when I received my confirmation letter from the OEA, I was two weeks at the hospital in intensive care because I had a high risk pregnancy. So the first thing I did when I was discharged from the hospital and I went to receive my confirmation letter and that day I will never ever forget. It will be a stepping stone for myself, for my mother, for my grandmother and even for my aunts who never pursue a career, right? A university career. So it was a new journey for me. And wow, it was a new journey, new life experience and life-changing experience. But you may think that it was easy. It wasn't because I started my first semester at the University of Aruba with a big belly. That was also my last semester, meaning I was able to pop at any time. So while being big, pregnant, I started hearing, hearing people telling me, are you sure you're gonna, um, you cannot wait to have this baby. Why not wait another year to register again? And to those people and to the society, I will tell you, no. You know why? I tried three times actually to register and now is, this is my time and I'm just gonna take it, right? Also, I heard, you know, being a new mom to a newborn and being a full-time student would not be easy. It wasn't easy. You know why? But I did have fun, I grew, right? But I not only grow, I was able to be elected two times to be in the social work board as an activity coordinator and the vice president. I helped the University of Aruba anytime they needed me in anything or any activities. I also helped my community in volunteering work in my own free time. I did all my internship placement at different organizations and NGOs, governmental organizations. And I served one year in Circle K Club of the University of Aruba as the president, while being a sister, while being a partner, and still while being a sister. So those, to those people, I will say, no, it wasn't easy, but it was fun to only prove to myself because I just was proving to myself that anything that I set forward, I could reach it. So staying with the team, my team, that's resiliency. I would say resiliency doesn't mean not giving up. Resiliency means when you get, you get down, you fall down, you cry and you dare even question yourself that you stand up 
and actually learn from your things that you wanted to, to learn from. The mistake you did, just pick it up and improve it. So I hope I can inspire anybody in this room that nothing, nothing is impossible. As long as you really want it, and as long as that you want to just grab it and, and become the best of your version. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Michelle Alont, for contributing with that story and as well for Roseanne. Mm -hmm. Clearly advancement of women in education. It's really impactful, your story and Roseanne as well. And I think we know many women like that amongst us because um, this is the Ruben woman. So let's continue um, to our next speaker, which is not unknown to many, Jocelyn, Jocelyn Cruz, as I heard yesterday, it's French. Yeah, I had to practice a bit more. <laughs> also on the radio yesterday, promoting this with uh, Sharon, is currently a special advisor to the cabinet of Aruba on partnership with international organization. She is chair of the National SDG Commission Aruba and chair of the National Gender Steering Committee. She provides strategic direction and coordinates the implementation of the SDGs here in Aruba while giving advice also to the cabinet on how to strategically navigate and position Aruba with international, region, regional, and multilateral organizations, including on sustainable development and the specific position of small island states. Jocelyn, the floor is yours. Bon tardi, Turhende. How are you? I feel very inspired by all the stories. Great to see, to hear of so many accomplishments and also despite so many challenges. Um, I had the privilege actually to also be the first minister plenipotentiary for Aruba in the United States of America. I wasn't on that, but that doesn't matter. But standing up here, I was like, okay, I tend to be a person that doesn't like tooting my horns, but I said, you know what? In this audience, it would be relevant because I was also a first in that sense. Right? <laughs> and you know what? Being a first or not, as you mentioned, we're all strong women, you know, and even though we don't believe, you always have to believe, as the prime minister said, believe in yourself. And that is how we can change things and draw a new course forward and a new better course forward and a course where we all enjoy a more equal, prosperous world and where we all live in a greater sense of well-being. So I thank you for this great event. Very timely, of course, as usual, because we are in very strange times. We're just emerging from COVID, as we all know, and society has quite been challenged by COVID. And you'll see women have been disproportionately affected, not only here in Aruba, we've seen it, of course, globally, probably much stronger in many places, but we're also in very uncertain times, in uncertain times in terms of what's happen happening politically. You know, and peace is so important. And today, actually, I wore a pin, and unconsciously so. I was a peacekeeper for the United Nations system in Mozambique in the early 90s. And I was thinking today, you know, looking at what's happening in the world, I was, this is strange. Later on, I also worked on a project, um, and I worked for United Nations Development Fund for Women, Back then was UNIFEM, that was a precursor of young women in their East African office. And I was based in Kenya and did projects in, um, on peace for women and engaging women in peace processes. And one of my pro projects was actually um, waging peace through women's voices. Because in Somalia, as you know, they have a long, long retracted war 
a long civil war, and there's no peace. But the premise was that women play such an important role in creating peace and upholding peace. And I see peace between country, but I also see peace everywhere. And peace is necessary for us all to move forward. So I just grabbed this and I said, that was a reminder of how everything is really connected. And just to bring this together, as mentioned, I am the chair of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal Commission on Aruba, in charge of giving strategic direction and coordinating the implementation for the SDGs on Aruba. And I'm also gen chair of the Gender Steering Committee. Of course, this conflate, very much so, because a very important part of achieving a better world is looking at the way we do development in a very integrated and holistic way. And one of the cross-cutting issue for achieving a more sustainable society is actually gender equality. Because without gender equality and including half of society and not giving half of society the place at the table, looking at the specific challenges that we have globally, we will not thrive as a world. We will not have peace. We will not have better futures. And that's the essence. And the prime minister had that foresight. <laughs> Pre-COVID, she said, I want to make a difference. And she instituted a gender commission to come with a holistic gender policy. Because without an official gender policy to frame where we need to go, it will be very difficult to really make the necessary changes that we need to move towards that stronger and more lasting sustainable future that we're all looking for. So thank you for that foresight, Prime Minister. And glad to lead together, of course, with our members, Paula. Let's see if we have any other members of the Gender Steering Committee here. Oh yeah, Magali. <laughs> Hi, Magali. Um, none else of my peers in the Gender Steering Committee. No, but I'm sure they'll hear in spirit and heart. So thank you. So we engaged pre-COVID on the journey. And it was challenging because it was pre-COVID. And the first very sad thing that happened was that the director of UN Women in Barbados passed away after having come to Aruba. They didn't fill her position, COVID hit. But anyways, we're here today. We're here with a plan that is based on a very strong situation and analysis of the situation of women in Aruba. Why? Because without doing an analysis of where we stand on key issues, we don't know where we are. And how was this analysis made? This analysis took very important frameworks that lead and have led towards the path of gender advancement already. This is the CEDA, Convention against this, for the Discrimination Against Women, and the Beijing Platform for Action, which is the most comprehensive, actually, framework for the advancement of women. In addition, of course, there we have our constitution of the Aruban Constitution that, of course, gives the direction and enshrines the principle of equality. And then recently, of course, since 2015, the government has committed itself to implementing the SDGs. So based on the situation analysis, we really looked at where the biggest advancement and the entry points need to be for the Aruban women to really make an advancement and also in order to reach gender equality. Again, I want to say what the situation analysis showed was since we're reaching, want to reach gender equality, that there are certain areas where actually men are starting to lag behind. And one of that is young boys in education. 
and that will have to be addressed. I want to do something though, since on, on the issue of that we're talking about here today, gender um, education. Interesting is it that the study showed that indeed, even though women have come to make great advancements throughout the years, and actually 60% of women are graduating more in higher education, 60% versus men at 40%, this hasn't yet translated necessarily in the professional field. Still two ministers out of um, eight, same with the parliamentarians, but that's across the board. And what the study really showed is that at the root of this is really the gender biases that we hold the gender stereotypes that we hold, what we think that is the role that belongs to a woman, what is the role that belongs to a man, and it's basically the social construct that we hold on to. And as the prime minister said, it's up to us as women, because we as women uphold these biases too, definitely about ourselves. We preclude ourselves from doing. We heard these stories, these women, despite having five children or three children, <laughs> did it. It's not easy. It's not easy, but they did it. And that's really incredible. Doesn't mean that every woman will have the chance or can do it. But coming back to Prime Minister's story about mothers, remember mothers are the primary educators of children, how you want it or not. Worldwide studies show that about 92% of children are taken care of definitely always by their mother. Men can be there too. So just see the impact that you have as well for those of us that are mothers on the next generation, on forming the gen next generation, on debunking those biases. We have a great influence. And sometimes that's why we need to work at ourselves again to debunk the sciences, look in the mirror. Where are those? And work with the men in educating our boys and girls in terms of breaking those stereotypes, changing those stereotypes. It's not easy. But a great way of doing it is by educating our women. Because studies also show that the higher a woman is educated, the more well-being there is within the family the more their children are successful in their education and the more a society progresses. So it's easy, you would think, but it's in here. <laughs> and it's in here, but it's in the media. I wanna say media because the media incredibly upholds those biases that we have. And it's sad, but we have to start also working with the media to help us change these biases. And we have to be strong at doing this. Anyway, I am gonna go on the gender policy a little bit. What it is, as I said, we looked at where, and we work together with young women and we work diligently, you know, trying to bring a group of 11 women together regularly and bring their parts is not always easy either. <laughs> But we did, and working with international partners, um, but we did it, right? And not only do we have a gender policy, but you know what we have? What we're going to present today is an action plan. So it's not just a piece of paper or strategy. No, we're going to see, we're going to have entry points, how we're going to do it. And in that, we would like to hear from you how you think as well you can contribute to this. It's not only a government's responsibility. We're only gonna achieve this is everybody gets engaged, right? If each of us commits. Then we have also prepared a monitoring evaluation plan attached to this action plan. Why? Because if we don't monitor and evaluate our action plan, we don't know if we're going in the right direction, if there are things that need to be changed, if we need to recalibrate, if things have changed, if we're successful or not. So there is a plan for that. So I'm gonna, now present to you shortly the action plans and each of you will have it 
at the table, right? And what we would like from you, and Charisse is gonna end on the side, you will have these on the side. I have a big, big one and it was stuck with paper on the back. <laughs> is that we have the focus areas for the gender policy. Sorry, I'm really, my mouth is really, really dry. And the idea is, yeah, so the idea is that you can look at these, but that you can think, you know, within these focus areas, what is really the action that needs to be taken to really be able to make an impact and to make a difference? you will see that some of this, a lot of it that we've noticed is that we need to assess. We have a lot of data missing. One of the, you can ask uh, Magali how we work on this, gender-based violence. We don't have official statistics on gender-based violence. Magali reports, the police doesn't really report consistently. There are no official statistics on gender-based violence. How do we know what intervention we need to take if we don't have, know how big, how small the problem really is. And it is a problem, we know that. Anecdotal evidence shows that it is a problem. So we need to do this. So that's why we thought in a room full of people, maybe you want to, you have ideas on how to do things. So a lot of these interventions are based on assessment, assess, assessing situations. How are you gonna do this, but also, how do we strengthen the structures we have? How do we create new initiatives? There's a lot of things, but how do we bundle forces? I think in Aruba, we have the tendency very often to work in silos, right? This is my little toko, this is my little toko. Um, you know, how do you bundle things? How do you make things more efficient and effective to be able to reach these goals? So let me go ahead before I take way too much time. <laughs> Well, it's like a whole chiquito. And no, let me see. No, and I have, I don't have my final glasses yet. So wait, I'm going to try to do this from here. And I'm just, so the gender equality action plan. We have created the vision. Yes. And even, so the prime minister, yes, this is supposed to be the final vision, the final draft. But that again, unfortunately, the person working at UN Women with us quit six months ago and she was just replaced last week uh, or two weeks ago. This has been quite a journey. So um, uh, things uh, that we thought were finalized weren't finalized. So we're getting a chance to um, give our feedback. So if you have any bright ideas, please don't go and change anything, but just as input, you're welcome to give some, definitely on the action plan. So let me go. I think I'll skip the vision. You can read that yourself. But I want to go into the strategic focus areas. The first one. It's okay, I'll do it from here. Is to strengthen systems and capacities to overcome structural barriers that impede gender equality and mainstream gender at all levels through increasing awareness and capacity to combat harmful norms, increasing the collection, analysis, and use of gender statistics, and increasing institutional capacity for gender mainstreaming. So what does that mean? That we need to strengthen our institution to mainstream gender. We have to look at things from a gender lens. That's basically what it says, right? And we have to take initiatives to really make our institutional institution works work to actually create more gender equal policy across the board. It's not just up to a one ministry. No, it's all ministries. It has to be integrated in all policies. Otherwise, in nota by logra. Focus two. Increase decent work opportunities and strengthen capacities for entrepreneurship and employment for women and marginalized groups. What we've seen is that, yes, there's more participation of women, but women tend 
to work more in the service industries, but those are also the lowest paying jobs. And what we've seen as well during COVID is that disproportionately more women lost their jobs, right? And there was an incredible increase of women receiving what we call bystand and also engage in FASA, the temporary measures that were given by the government. So this shows the vulnerability of women that work in the service industries. And this is something that education could play a strong role, that we have women that are more educated and that can have more stability for themselves and their families. Then we also have strategic objective three, is enhance access to justice and quality services regarding gender-based discrimination and violence. Again, this is what we're talking about as well in terms of the, what we've seen with gender-based violence is that the chain, the Katen, is getting stronger because I think as well to the crisis plan that was instituted, it also looks at women, but there's still a lot to be done. And also women having access to justice. And um, where's our lawyer? Sorry, <laughs> the student. Like, oh no, she it was a video. Sorry, <laughs> I've lost. It was a video. So, you know, just saying that, you know, women, people that really care and women need representation, need access to representation because maybe they cannot afford it. So it's very important because believe me, women that have been battered and their children are battered don't have the energy and necessarily the mental power to walk the way. They need assistance, they need help, and they're great institutions doing this. But we've seen through as well the situation analysis, there, there's so much more that can be done. So this is in this area, we focus particularly on that situation. Then we have strengthened quality gender sense of health nutrition services, education to women, girls, members, LGBTQ community and other marginalized groups, including the protection of sexual and reproductive health and rights. Aruba in general, you know, um, when you look very often, we think, okay, in terms of reproductive health and rights, we have a very good system. I must say compared to, to the world and the region, we have a robust system. We can admit that. Um, starting from early at childbirth, you know, being in the role of the mother is the Vitgele Kruis, but you know, Familia Plania, the care that is given is very good. However, where we've seen discrepancies as well is in the high indices of NCDs, Men actually are worse, but we're still one of the highest as well for women in the region. Making the reality face us that it's a high cost as well, of course, on Azad Bay, if we're not healthy, but also in the way we perceive ourselves and our health. And this is something as well that needs to be looked at from a gender lens and also health in terms of, especially what we see now, mental health. The adequate support also to victims of domestic-based violence. It's not there, unfortunately. We have a very long walk list. We have a lot of challenges. So this is really looking at what can be done, what activities can be done, what strategies have been designed to be able to achieve these areas. This is extremely important as well. Everything is important, but the point is that we have looked at it from a holistic view. We have looked at the challenges that were brought forward in the analysis and then said, okay, these are gonna be the entry points. So if you feel yourself called as well, you know, it's right now that we have to start making the changes. Now we don't have to wait until these events but we're all, and I know of some women that are very active 
right? And this is great. And Viola, you know, I was telling Viola that the other day, I mean, so wonderful. And I'm going to say it out loud to have a female president. And I see the difference at the university in engaging on these issues as well. And thank you so much. You're a star, you know, because um, in the past as well, and some of you may, I, I tend to go a lot to the university because I'm like, okay, the role that the community, the university plays for the community, but we, this is our primary learning institution, and this is where we have to get our ideas or from, you know, and this is where things can be developed and done. So thank you for that, for your support. So um, no further ado, I thank you all for being here as well on this end. And I really, really ask you to look at this and to contribute. And one, once the policy is there, I'm sure it's gonna be published, right, Prime Minister? And so uh, you can all look at it and see, you know, how you can make it your own and to have others making their own and to really create action and change. Thank you. Thank you, Jocelyn. Now I'd like to go forward, even though she likes to stay behind, my colleague, Sharice Bundeli. Sharice is a coordinator for the Office of Student Affairs for the marketing, but she's very much involved in many ways within the community and will be a facilitator today for our table discussion. It's going to be a very brief and, in, and intensive um, discussion. As Jocelyn said, we hope to this will be input um, that can be used further. Sharice, can you just come forward and explain to the ladies and gents what the idea is of the table discussion? Because having a plan 
and additive and how can we use that to take the back to scratch activity? We want to make sure that whenever we do implement it, and we can only do that if we have your ideas. Am I clear? Are we good? Yeah. Are we ready to reveal? Yeah. We do need to help you. Go back to my hand. Okay, so everybody, please engage in conversation and look at the students walk around and consent the table. Okay. Well, the same thing that you did, you can then write the bright version. Is that for my time? Oh, you know, we have been telling you. It's only missing the bright version. You make it to be missing. I think it's so interesting. It's a sad inspiration. People just want to write that. Nog een ik idee idee was, was dat ik moest het in het dat ik moest in geen meer meer Toen was dat wat ik denk dat ik was voor je, dat hij leidt. Dus if you're up to it, um, you know, just check from the class of the top. Dus als je wil, dan is dat niet zo. 12 per dag en 1 per dag. Goed idee. Heb je een mensen te doen? Heb je een mensen te doen? But if she really says no, we call her to a technician to blur out the block at home. Because she said that she had to do it. But if she says no, write a more official. And I said, how do you? Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
We move that as per. I'm an eight test. Okay. Thank you. 
Als iedereen weer in de zaal is, laten we eerst een video zien. En dan na de video gaan we naar de punt. Oké, okay, ja. dan hebben ze iets om. Uh, ja. Please take your seats so we can proceed. Like that is a video seen. Uh, just lean the. Uh... Misschien zou het inderdaad ook faciliteren. Can we all take our seats? Can I have your attention, please? So before we go on to continuing this discussion, because I can hear you guys are very excited and I'm looking forward to hearing the action plans that were, that came up with, sorry. <laughs> I would just like to share a, sh a short video. Oh, the group of the video. Uh, ik ga eerst de, de video van even zes een afbreken. Er is een groep coming, so. But in the meanwhile, I think in in light of time, it's better we continue. So if I can have your attention, please. We have a special video. Hello, good morning. Good morning. My, My name is, is Tony Broad. I am the representative for the UN Women Multi Country Office in the Caribbean. We cover 22 countries and territories. Thank you, Sharice. Can I have you to sign up where we should start? We're very happy to see that everyone wants to share their ideas. Uh, but we're going to go on a short video. And once we've done that, we're going to ask the blue person behind the screen. Yes. 
So uh, just yeah. two minutes more, yeah. and then Reva, the word is yours. So I'll just share with you a video by Tony Brober. She is a representative of the UN Women Multi-Country Office in the Caribbean. And she had a very special message for us. Hello, good morning. My name is Tony Broadba. I am the representative for the UN Women Multi-Country Office in the Caribbean. We cover 22 countries and territories, including beautiful Aruba. Today in Aruba, and soon across the Caribbean and world, we collectively come together to commemorate International Women's Day 2022 under the theme, Gender Equality Today for a Sustainable Tomorrow. Aruba has rightfully been lauded for its significant strides in advancing gender equality, ranging from being one of what are still too few countries with a woman head of government to having higher access and levels of access to education by women and girls. While such progress has to be celebrated, the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic against the global backdrop of increasingly devastating natural hazards has undermined many of the positive gains towards actualizing gender equality, poverty reduction, and access to opportunity and decent livelihoods, both in Aruba and beyond. All of these things are gender inequality issues. For example, UN Women estimates that globally 47 million women and girls have been pushed into poverty as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, bringing the total number of women and girls in poverty to 435 million. In 2019, 4.9% of people in Aruba lived under the World Bank poverty line for high-income countries, and 0.6% lived below the international poverty line of $1.90 a day. Despite Aruba's previous efforts to shrink the employment gap between men and women, with the onset of COVID-19, the 2020 census in Aruba revealed that 22,282 women, 48% of the total population, compared to 16,376 men, 40.9% of the population were inactive many of whom were primarily employed in the tourism and services industries. Unpaid care work undertaken by women globally has risen. Data is not yet available for Aruba, but with the Inter-American Development Bank 2020 findings that on average among countries surveyed almost twice as many women versus men experienced increased cleaning, cooking, homeschooling, and entertaining of children. Also of critical concern are the increased reports of gender-based violence, which are primarily violence against women and girls around the world. In Aruba, the Fundación Contra Violencia Relacional that supports victims of domestic violence recorded 183 new cases in 2020, 176 of which were women. 60% of new clients were not Aruban and 14% had illegal immigration statuses. Essentially, the COVID-19 pandemic has shed a greater light on the ongoing ways in which women and girls have to continue to be disproportionately impacted and underrepresented in every strata of society. And this is something that really also outlines the issues of intersectionality the ways in which sex, gender identity, age, nationality, socioeconomic class intersect to create opportunities or increase challenges. As a result, Aruba, like many countries, is at a critical point. Moving forward, how can Aruba and indeed the entire Caribbean build back better? Or, as we prefer to say, build forward equal? from COVID-19. It begins with repositioning the sales to develop and implement more inclusive policies, programming, and equal access to health services, innovative education, and better economic opportunities and livelihoods that support the actualization of the universal human rights for women and girls. 
Aruba has already begun this important work. Through its current work to develop a national gender policy, the aim of which is to create an enabling environment for achieving gender equality and women's empowerment and to build back equal and better from COVID-19. On this International Women's Day, I especially commend the government of Aruba for your dedication to developing the Aruba gender policy and your commitment to collaboration to chart a new way forward. May you continue to integrate the resources of government institutions, public and private sector, civil society, including faith-based organizations and international development partners, starting from a base which acknowledges and designs from the perspectives and insights, the skills, voices, and equal contribution of all women and men can only redound to your country's development the lessons of which would hold value for us all in the Caribbean and across the world. In doing so, the sustainable development of Aruba in terms of gender equality, peace, justice, health and well-being, economy and culture will be secured. Please know UN Women stands ready to continue to support the government of Aruba. We want to also commend the incredible work of your Prime Minister in pushing and ensuring Equality is a reality for all in Aruba. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful International Women's Day. A beautiful message. I would like now, to, I would like to give uh, Cherise the word and you have a faithful assistant. Yes. Viola Heitzfeld will be making notes. <laughs> well, Hi, um, as was already stated, my name is Mandy Laclay and um, I'm a future sociologist focusing on social inequalities. So some of these points, you can see my, my mark on it. Um, so we had focus four, strengthening gender sensitive health and nutrition service. Um, we discussed sexual education that is more gender informed. So informing specifically on the biases for boys and girls um, and the issues facing that, these groups. Um, we also talked about sexual education that is informed on queer issues. So uh, people that are transgender um, or gay and, and focusing on these issues too, because it seems that in my own experience in, in receiving sexual education, it is much more on heteronormative uh, values and a lot of scare tactics, which brings me to my, my third point. Um, sexual education that is more about empowering people in their bodies and not being scared of, let's say, um, getting tested regularly and, and taking charge of your sexual health. And fourth, we had a full analysis of scientific data and including women in scientific studies because in terms of uh, uh, medical um, studies, much of, it, much of it is focused focused on the bodies of men. And lastly, we also had more education on the specific nutritional needs for women and um, in combating issues such as osteoporosis and informing them on better um, taking care of their health. Thank you so much. Well, 
Yeah. Hi. So our focus point was on women's economic empowerment, decent work and entrepreneurship, um, looking at barriers and solutions. Um, one of the biggest barriers the group identified is essentially what's been mentioned, stereotypes um, also stand as a barrier for women, being seen either as more emotional, also the heavier care and domestic burden that women shoulder and the need to redistribute that more equally, raise more awareness, as well as provide more government support in that area. Um, women also need to support each other. And this was seen as something that women don't always do in Aruba. So less jealousy, more support for women to women. Um, in terms of other areas of support, grants as well, when we're looking at small businesses and entrepreneurship, grants for women and particularly the most marginalized women, um, enabling more access to loans and finance, which is an area where women, particularly poor women, are often discriminated against. Um, less red tape in general to be able to start a business for men and women. Uh, this was seen as one of the very difficult areas in Aruba. And um, yes, that was on the entrepreneurship side. There were three sort of questions within it. So um, access to educational spaces and STEM was another area. Combating social norms and stereotypes of men as being dominating in these areas. Also identified was the fact that because of Lago, there were, have historically been a lot of men in these areas, in the technological industries in Aruba. So there is a need for more role models, visible role models. Male teachers are seen as the norm, putting more visibility towards women in all areas, at all levels of education, role modeling, and in social media. So more awareness raising campaigns of women's roles in these areas. Um, yes, and that would be it. <laughs> Good evening. I hope you noticed she said we'll keep it short. So I will skip who I am and all of that. We had to, we um, looked at focus group of focus point three. And we looked at strategic objective, enhanced access to justice and quality services regarding gender-based discrimination and violence. We identified four points. We had two questions. We identified four points with the first question. The first point was that we thought that we um, could see systematic obstacles for people who are um, um, victims. One example was, for instance, if you have, um, uh, understand if you have financial support from the government and you get a job that is often you need to report that you have the job and um, fear of not knowing if that job is permanent is often one of the reasons why people are hesitant to go into the labor market time um, the another one we had was trauma assistance trauma informed care assistance, we think that that should be more, should be better, it should be supported, it should be clear that this is available and not only focusing at getting you out of the, 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 the system, but also the care, the, the, the nazorah, the care that is you are entitled to if you want to have sustainable um, 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 help or help that is sustainable. And then we also talk about in the justice system, um, training, sensitivity training for police, lawyers, all those who are in the justice system. We think that training is very important or we thought that training would be very important. And we also thought about not such 
incidental awareness campaigns. I think you all will agree with us that campaigns are often very incidental. I think Clem mentioned the 25th of November. I said the 10th of December, International Day of Human Rights or International Day of the CEDAW. I, uh, I think it's in the 25th of November, right, Jocelyn? So we thought, oh, you're short, uh -huh, short, okay. And then I can't think, I know she watching me like that. Okay, and then we also talked about Clachton Delict and um, the lawyer amongst us just left the room. So I'm going to help myself. What I understood is that we need that you, the way the law is um, written, it, there is a great emphasis on the role of the victim um, also being, um, um, yes, somebody to press charges. Yes, that is what I wanted to say. Okay, it's open for interpretation. Well, we said that we think we need to enable and enter a dialogue about that specific provision. You have that? <laughs> I got to go. You see, she's... <laughs> So I'll try to keep it uh, sweet and short. Um, our focus was on uh, focus one, so how to address gender stereotypes and biases and how to ensure uh, compliance with any initiatives that are uh, came. It was a group effort. I'm just reading it. Um, so awareness raising workshops at Centro de uh, Barrios all over the island as one way to go about it. Um, increased inclusivity of all affected groups. So within the discussion, um, with a, a, a broader focus on intersectional discrimination uh, when identifying the stereotypes. So the same thing the UN representative Tony just said. Um, emphasis uh, or placing emphasis on why equality is important. And one really good one is studying why people discriminate in the first place. Um, what else do we have? And then increased awareness via talk show and social media. Um, involve and activate religious leaders within the discussion. Um, re repeatedly focus on the subject. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, having a yearly um, event uh, for uh, Gender Day. Um, creation of a gender award, uh, ge gender award for norm changing enterprises or institutions. <laughs> Almost done. Um, looking into uh, parental leave, father's cups for love, um, as a way to address the stereotype that womanhood means motherhood. So also giving men um, equal opportunity to uh, play a role in uh, parental up upbringing of children and mindset transformation with a focus on how women uh, themselves reinforce stereotypes and also how they resist stereotypes. Uh, one of the good examples that uh, my colleague gave me was um, when women reach a certain age, you're expected to become a mother, and then there's something wrong with you if you are not a mother. Mm -hmm. So uh, this usually is a conversation between women, so women can reinforce it, but she gave the example where she says, I, um, there's nothing wrong with me and I do not have to explain why I want uh, to become a mother or don't want to become a mother. So as an act of resistance. Wow. 
Yes, thank you very much to all of you. I think this was already a vivid discussion where we can now proceed with in our beautiful garden. And I see so many known and unknown faces. So I'm really looking forward to meeting all of you in our garden. And thanks again to all who made this event possible, who was really, yeah, starting on a table for people no money, no, I, yeah, and the ideas came and everything evolved. And now we're here together. Let's make use of this event, get to know each other, network, exchange your contact details and enjoy our wonderful Tostao catering. Welcome. <laughs> Nos turta boga para un vida próspero y logre saque a pesar de reto nanco por presentar. Un de objetivo nan de meta nan mundial para desarrollo sostenible ta para llegar a un empleo decente, honesto y independencia económico. Es aquí ta un historia de esperanza, innovación y un ejemplo de un compañía que logra prosperar. Mientras se ta un aporte social y ta tiene cuenta que impacto arriba medio ambiente de su actividad comercial. Como empresaria, Momester tiene una actitud innovativa y positiva. Es aquí la historia de Vadabas, una compañía que me afundé con un propósito, para crear oportunidad para mamá en soltero. Ahora mi mamá comienza con su negocio, ella contrata a mamá en soltero para ayudar a trabajar en la de la comodidad de la casa. No por trabajar de una mesa hora y así no por pasar más tiempo con la ayuna. Y también por cumplir con otra responsabilidad en la vida. Lo que me gusta es que dividamos con porta más tiempo con mi mamá y así no me por ayudar. Nos te crea el diseño de joya, después nos te provee el material en la mamá en la casa. Nada traja el accesorio en la mano. No está paquetando los productos en el papel de cartón. 